All right, recording today with Karen Hugo. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. How about you, Brett? I'm great. I'm great. Now, you're in South Africa. We met um, officially on, on my travels down there a few weeks ago and had a great time. South Africans looked after me really well, especially um, in your neck of the woods in Stellenbosch. I had a, a fantastic time there, but just get to know everybody, but getting to know you too. And um, and I know that you've got uh, an affinity for sprinting. So we, we connected very quickly. Yes, um, I, I love sprinting. That's my passion. And that's why I, where I try and spend most, most of my time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I work in a, in, a, in a swimming club, so I have to do a little bit of everything. But when and if I can, I, uh, I make sure that I do a lot of sprinting work. Yeah, I love it. Well, just in terms of that, give us your background because sprinting is not something that is really a profound kind of um, training method. Uh, most most of the swimmers there train specifically for two hundreds um, and then and then up. There's not a lot of uh, people that are really focused on fifties or hundreds per se. Um, and and you're certainly doing that. But how did it develop for you? When, where did it start for you? Um, so I used to coach at a university called Stellenbosch University, um, and there was a guy who came to see us, a student. He said he wanted something different. He was a he was more of a sprinter. Um, I said to the head coach, "I'm willing to give it a go." And from there, we started training twice a week. I invited one more person, a girl called Emma Chelius. Um, so Emma and Bryce, the the, the the two, the two of them started doing sprint sets with me twice a week. Um, at the beginning, I, um, I basically went on the internet and looked up sprint sets and um, was very much um, still unsure what I was doing. Mm. But from there on, it just grew and it just transformed into this um, amazing. Um, yeah, amazing story. Um, and yeah, the squad, the sprinting squad grew very quickly. And there was also a lot of students who didn't want to spend too much time in the water. They wanted to come in. They wanted to do some some sprint work and, and get out. So two sets became three sets a week. Three sets became four sets. And before we knew it, we had this massive sprint squad <laughs> um, at the university. And yeah, and and they were swimming fast and they were doing well and it was just amazing um, how it developed. Yeah. A- Emma Chilius goes on to um, swim in the semifinal of the Olympics in Tokyo. And and I want to dive into that a little bit more because that is a fascinating story, just how that developed. Like you said, you, you said something that was interesting there where you said they wanted something different. Um, what, what were they getting and what, what could you kind of, demise what what they were asking for like what what did they want that was different so at that stage they were definitely doing very much a general program you know we had um maybe eight nine sessions a week um a lot of there was aerobic work there was some lactate production there was um a a general program a lot of 200s a lot of 400 work Mm. um a lot of hundreds work as well but long you know, 30 100s mm. that type of scenario and um they wanted something that was shorter for one thing they don't want to spend five kilo- two hours or three hours in the water yep. so they don't want to do a five kilometer set always yep. they wanted to um have more speed in there high intensity at stages mm-hmm. um yeah and shorter intervals that was basically it mm. Isn't it funny how the the athletes are coming to you as the coach and saying, "Hey, we want we want this, we want something different," and for you to have to then, you know, research and and look into what other people are doing and and how they're doing it, and and I think that's, you know, I I, I use this hashtag a lot um, right now in in all my posts. I say sprint revolution, right? And and this is kind of part of that revolution where I think athletes like Cam McAvoy, and, and it really began with Cam McAvoy, um, basically was in a traditional program and said, no, this, this doesn't feel right. It's not, this isn't happening the way I want it to happen. I'm not doing what I want to do. And Cam goes and flips it on its head 
and and does the same thing, researches and then goes ahead and creates his own program and then goes on to win a world title. It sounds like you and, and Emma Chilius and some of those other athletes kind of had that same idea, you know, three or four years ago. Yeah, and then, and you know, I was just playing around um, um, with, with what you could do. Um, I had a, a PhD in sports science. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I come from a scientific background and I'd, I've done a lot of conditioning with different teams in my life. I, I was a, um, I, the head scientist for the SA hockey women's team for, mm. for six years. Mm. So a lot of stuff I actually did with them, like stay running and stuff like that, I started incorporating into the swimming and different conditioning programs and just doing different things with them um, that was sort of out of the box um, and starting to develop my own my own philosophy, my own programs, um, playing with the intensity per set. And I made mistakes. Don't, don't get me wrong. At the beginning, you know, so, uh, sometimes I felt I did too little. Sometimes I felt I did too much. Um, and I'm still learning. I still learn from the guys like you, from uh, so many resources around the world. Mm. Um, I'm learning from Cam at the moment. It's interesting when he, does does talks and podcasts what how he does things mm. um so it's, it's 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 i'm on this journey which i'm loving at the moment yeah and i i love the fact that you're on this journey you're i'm on the journey with you too look i i think i know a lot but i don't know everything and i and i don't know how to get people to swim on the men's side i don't know how to get people to swim under 21 seconds yet without a without a suit well you know we've proven it with a suit we can do that I haven't haven't proven that. No one has proven that without a suit yet. And and certainly on the women's side, I think we're still looking at the possibility of maybe one day somebody swimming under 23 seconds long course. I mean, that that is a real possibility. It seems far out right now, but it's like we've got to be aiming for that. And you're seeing women now creeping up on 50 seconds in the 100 freestyle. I mean, we're, we're very close to kind of having some breakthrough there, I think. Um, men are obviously more and more men are going 46 in the hundred. So there's, there's a lot of exploration going on right now. And I love the fact that you're in this and doing it. I also love the fact that you've got a scientific background and, and you've got science to back you up. This is, you're not just, you know, throwing something against the wall and saying, I don't know what I'm doing here. You've, you've actually got, you know, a real education that can back a lot of what you're, what you're believing and what you're feeling um, so in terms of, you know, you, you say that balance and, and we're all trying to figure out that balance of what, what's, what's too little, what's too much. Um, when, when you talk about the science of it, uh, where have you found that you, you feel like you get some pretty good results doing certain things? So, um, if you talk, if you talk load wise, mm -hmm. um, I hardly go, over 3.5 kilometers um, in a set. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm very much, we do, uh, and we go six, no, seven sets a week with Emma, for instance. Um, so that's that's what, what we do, but a lot of it is high intensity. And mm -hmm. I think that's what makes the difference is that we always are working at a fast rate. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no... Um, there's no, uh, there's not a lot of mileage that that, except maybe for a little bit of warm up or stuff like that, that we're not applying to do something. We always do working on something. Mm. You know, even in our warm up, we might be doing working on not breathing or um, yeah. Today I did a hypoxic free set uh, in with my with the sprint group mm. um, to make sure that we're working on on not breathing as much in, in a 50 or n not at all, right. but we're always working towards something and there's not a lot of mileage that that's just swimming or garbage yardage or, mm. um, and I, I think the main set for sprint training, it's I'm, I'm about the quality of the main set. It doesn't have to be a two 2000 meters long or 3000 meters long. It's about what quality are you producing in your main set? Right. Right. The, the quality is a huge factor, right? Like you, you want to be at maximum speeds as often as you can. 
um, to get those gains. And, and that's what a lot of sprint programs now are, are playing with. And I think gone are the days where we say sprinters don't work hard, right? Like there used to be this thing that, that if you didn't do a certain amount of yardage, you know, that the middle distance distance from us were hitting that there was this belief that you didn't want to work hard or you didn't work hard. And that's just a, a, a myth. And it's been busted many times. I don't know why some people are hanging on to it. Um, but, you know, e even with Emma, for instance, like where you took her from to where you took her to in such a short period of time, when you first got her, where was she at? And, and how did you end up getting into the semifinals at the Olympic Games? So she was... Um... She was probably on a 26 high to, uh, for 50 meter freestyle, wow. 26 high. Um, and we, she came from a coach called Graham Hill, um, mm -hmm. who did, I mean, he did well with her. He's a good, very good um, coach. Um, but she did, yeah, so she, she, she was, you know, and when she got at the university, like everybody else, she fell into the normal program. She didn't enjoy it. And she was actually right. thinking of quitting. And then I said, well, let's, let's try this, something different with you. Mm. And she just progressed very quickly with the sprint type of sprint work we mm. were doing. Um, and she had to get to go to student world games or university hard, uh, which was her goal at that stage in, in 2018. Um, we had to get her to a, 25.95. So we had to make sure she get, goes under 26. Um, and and we had to do that at our national championships. Um, and it was great because the first, she did it in, in the heats, the, the morning, which was, um, you know, which we were really, really well. And it also, her 100 also improved dramatically at that same stage and then because you went 25.95 she at that stage she was the fastest south african um female she got into the world champs team <clears throat> which mm. which was great and then she just got faster and faster and faster from there um so she, she was in the 25s all the time playing around and then we had to get the next step was basically qualifying for for tokyo which was a 24, 24, seven, eight, I think, um, for Tokyo. Um, so, you know, she never before, before Olympic qualifiers, she never swam under 25. And wow. she also did the, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> it, it, she, she did it that the morning in the heats, she qualified for, um, for Tokyo. So it took off the pressure a little bit for the final in the evening. We only have a, of heats and final, we don't have a semi final at our national champs <clears throat> because we don't have the depth, um, depth in our swimming. Um, so yeah, we dropped two seconds in the 50, um, just by doing high intensity sprint work. Um, and she dropped quite a lot, I think about three seconds in a hundred meter, um, uh, uh, just by doing a different type of program that you know. Most people won't probably. Well, most coaches don't think it's it's good enough at this stage. Right, right. Now, the massive gains, massive gains. That's that's incredible, and the fact that she was almost on the verge of quitting and swimming yeah. those times, and then getting to where she did, and then and then getting to an Olympic semifinals, just massive. Uh, and I'd love to hear those kinds of stories because that's what we need. We need more of those out there. Um, let me ask you this: in terms of what you would think in uh, in terms of um, the specificity, um, how much specific work were you doing for the 50 as opposed to the 100 during that period of time? Was there more of an emphasis on preparing for the 100 or more of an emphasis on preparing for the 50, you think? So funny enough, there was more emphasis on the 100. Right. Mm -hmm. Because um, we... The, uh, Swim South Africa fought our girls, our females have a good chance to qualify for the relay. Right. Um, and because she wasn't close to a 24-7 at that stage, um, she was on a 25-0-5 was her fastest. You know, we thought probably her best chance would be um, going, 
right in the relay. They take at least four people in the relay. We knew she had, she was one of the top 100 meters swimmers in the country. So we did a lot of work on the 100, a lot of 25s at 100 meter pace. Um, a lot of, I did a lot of 75s for, for speed endurance work, which I still think is, it, it's great. 75s for speed endurance. I, I think it's, it's very important type of work. Um, we, we did, we did get more specific in terms of details, um, making sure her divers gets better, making sure her finishes gets better, making sure that we training, um, more specific work, more specifics, faster. We, 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 yeah, we did a lot of more work rotating. So, um, we had, she was quite flat at the stage. So we made sure she started rotating more. Mm. Um, we made sure she, she kept, she, she kept her length better towards the mm. end. Mm -hmm. Her speed, uh, kept her height, a tempo, her speed, speed rate up. Um, so we did started doing more specific work, um, but we were focusing more on the hundreds, although I, I, you know, I incorporated a lot of speed work anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But the real difference, or I think this is what my opinion, one of the real things that made, real, made a real difference is she became stronger. Right. Stronger in the gym, but also stronger in the water. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. did, we started um doing more resistance work yeah. and i now that i that that i listen to cam mcavoy and some of uh, some of your podcasts i actually think we can do even more so i i don't think we at the pinnacle at all but we did start doing resistance work at least once or twice a week um and we made sure that the gym was of real quality luckily you know because i've got a science background i was able to write I can write all our programs and mm. I can adapt it to what I'm doing in the water, which is great. Um, you know, and she believes in that. So that's important. And and I think she, because we were progressing and kept progressing, she really believed in what we were doing. And I think that made a major difference. Wow. That's fantastic. You're, you're, you're a kind of a, a revolutionist out in South Africa, Karen, uh, you're doing things that not many people are doing, if if any. Um, you're really taking it to a, a new level, and and I love that. You know, you you've had to kind of go out there and take a chance, take a risk. It's nice to see when it when it pays off like this. You know, you got a swimmer who's dropped so much time and making semifinals at the Olympics, and um, and that's just kind of scratching the surface, like you said. So, do you do you feel proud now that you kind of took those chances and took those risks and and learn? You feel like you learned a lot during that process. Yes, I learned an uh, incredible amount, um, especially, you know, during COVID. It was, it was, a, I just, because we didn't, we couldn't do anything. I just sat most of my days at the computer and I just, anything I could find on sprinting, um, I was just, I just ate up basically. And um, I still do. I go on Instagram constantly. I go uh, I listen to podcasts, whatever I can find. Um, we're a little bit isolated in South Africa. Um, we don't get, um, you know, we don't tour as much and we don't have all the um, opportunities that some of the other countries have. But I, I, whatever I can do, whatever, whatever thing I can find, I try and um, – read and ask and luckily you know people like you you're always helping you know nobody's everybody will help if i see something that i'm not sure what it is like um the other day I, on one of the instagrams one of the university colleges they actually attached a, a fish scale to a bungee cord to mm -hmm. measure the output of resistance right and i wasn't sure what it was you know i just saw this gadget <laughs> and um you know and i it, it was I asked the the coach what it was, and he was, you know, they were so kind enough to just tell tell me what it was, what they're looking for, what it's all about, um, and then, yeah, then I must decide what what do I use and what do I 
mm. because there's also a lot of gimmicks outside. Right. That's that. That I also know. You know, there's a lot of gimmicks. So, yeah. uh, but luckily, I've that I've got that science background. So, I must always I always think about what I've seen, what will work for Emma or the the sprinters I have, what won't, or how can I adapt it? We don't have power towers, unfortunately, or bucket systems. So we have to use more innovative systems and like. So I've learned a lot from you with the t-shirts and with the with the parachutes um, and from everywhere in the world. I've just looked what they do. Um, uh, there was a German team out here a couple of years ago who introduced us to the rotation wheels. Mm-hmm. And I I, um, I I try and incorporate it. And yeah, I'm, I am proud. I, I'm very proud. I'm also, I think from a female point of view, and also in South Africa, there's not a lot of female coaches mm. that has produced Olympians. So um, it is it is a special honor. Yeah, it is a special honor. And I think there should be more South African coaches coming to you now and saying, okay, what did you do? What can we learn from you? Because you, you've put that time and energy into kind of researching what everybody else is doing, which is fantastic. But now you also have that knowledge. And I think that they should be spending more time asking you questions because you're at the forefront of this. You're you're at you you know you're doing something that not many people in that country are doing, and having success with it, and doing the research and doing the time and getting results. Um, it'd be great if if they asked you more. I think in the future. So um, you, you did talk about resistance, right? And and I did a seminar on resistance just recently, putting it out there. And I, and again, it was. Ultimately, it was it was because there was a lot of talk about resistance and a lot of questions, um, and and part of it for me is is that exploration too. Is like, look, I don't have all the answers on what's the best things to use, but here's here's all the different pieces of equipment that people are using. I wanted to present all those things. I want to present how they were doing it, how you could incorporate it into your programs, um, and then maybe just explore other new ideas too. I think that. Again, I think we're just scratching the surface, but when it comes to resistance, I've found that coaches are either, um, you know, it, it takes time and energy to to outfit a group of people with a certain piece of resistance. You know, it, it takes organization. I just found that coaches would prefer just to give a set and have people swim up and down the pool rather than put the time and energy into creating, you know, really interesting workouts that use equipment. And may, maybe it might be a cost thing or, or a time thing or whatever it is, but I find more and more coaches are exploring the idea now. Um, what were some of the pieces of equipment that you felt you had some success with? And then, and then I imagine you would want at some stage to experiment with some, some buckets, I'd imagine, because you don't have those in South Africa, but what, what were the things that you were using that you felt you had success with? Yeah. So I, um, I play around a little bit. I like, uh, I like to, to make it interesting and fun um, for my swimmers. And mm-hmm. um, good. <laughs> with, yeah, yeah. I, because I get bored, and if I get bored, I, I'm sure they get bored. Yeah. So um, we we use the rotation wheel, which I know you got introduced to at in South Africa. Yeah, um, some people call that a propeller. Oh, propeller. Yeah, sorry. That, yeah, that's the other name for a propeller. Um, so that's the one thing we use different types of sheets parachutes as well mm-hmm. uh, the Finnish ones are probably the best known um, and then uh, we we also because everything is so expensive we make our own, own sponges right. you know that's the other thing that we we've got different types of sponges um, and also because we've got different types of uh, genders in our in our groups and and different types of levels in my senior senior group um, you know some some of the more senior boys will use certain certain equipment to make it heavier for them where the girls might use sponges, which is a little bit lighter and they can produce it. With Emma, I play around. I use different types of equipment um, all the time. So she's got a sponge. She's got, um, yeah, that the rotation wheel. I've just gotten her parachute mm-hmm. So as well. So we play around and then don't forget the fins and the paddles which yep. is we, we forget about it because that's also resistance yeah so um and even little things like tennis balls i play around with that you know that they don't always can hold that they swim with a fist like type of thing and that they really work with their 
with the rest of their arms, not just only with their hands sometimes. Um, and to, so I, 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 the sets are different every week. I don't, I don't, they don't do the same sets. I, mm -hmm. I make sure that they have different sets and then I try and play around with the, the equipment um, maybe go from light to heavy or sometimes from heavy to light, um, change the loads up. Um, if it's, if it's a longer distance, they have to go with the, with resistance, you know, maybe sometimes heavier, maybe sometimes lighter. Um, if there's limited rest, you know, I, maybe I'll go with the sponge rather than with the rotation wheel, but it's all pretty much, um, different loads, different scenarios, different, different, different things that they can play with um, and, and feel good about what they're doing at the end of the day. And, right. and they love these sessions. Yes. Um, I, on today's Wednesday um, and on Wednesdays, the, and my entire club does, does, a, does a sprint set with, with resistance. Um, and uh, the attendance are always great because everybody <laughs> loves that, that type of, play which they can yeah. do with with us in the set but uh i think resistance is definitely the way the future for sprinters um i think we're going to learn a lot on how to do it yeah um I've actually you were talking about the bucket system mm. um i've actually learned i've learned that somebody um quite close to you might have a bucket system that they've imported from america mm. so the next step is to hear if i can use it with emma when she comes down for training camp um, and see what we can can do with that. There we go. That'll that'll be like the elusive, um, you know, uh, what what's the one animal that everybody wants to see out in South Africa, but it's really hard to see the, the not the cheetah, what's the other one? The rhinoceros. The leopard. The leopard, the leopard. Yeah, the leopard. The leopard's so hard to see. That That's what the bucket yeah. system in South Africa will be like the leopard, you know? So you got to get some footage of that so everybody can see that there's one in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I was gonna ask you this look you're you you know the science and you know the the biology of this like when when you do take something away you've generally got to add something if you want to have some gain so if you're going to take volume away which we do we do want to take the volume away but then you're going to raise the intensity well then you know that that's going to have an effect on the body right like if you're raising the intensity levels then it's almost like you're taking a baseball bat every workout and you're beating the body as hard as you can, you know, at some point you got to recover that body in order to come back and, and get those gains that you want. So did you, did you find that, like you found that even though they were doing less volume, let's say that, but the intensity came up, the, the recovery had to be a major component of making progressive gains, right? Yeah. The recovery plays a, huge role or also because near the neuromuscular fatigue is so mm -hmm. much higher mm -hmm. um you know so and where you maybe had you only had neuromuscular fatigue maybe once or twice a week because you were in the gym um now you've got neuromuscular fatigue every day basically um because we except for maybe a friday we do high intensity every day so the recovery becomes very very important and it's a, and that's also why we don't do as many sets you know if you go if you try and do nine or ten sets a week you just you, you're never going to recover and you will probably not get faster at the you know so you, so um so we make sure that um first of all that the load is less that that the sets are less that um that the intensity sometimes are that the sets are shorter then we make sure that rest is important you know that they mm. that there's enough sleep at night um and uh, in tokyo that was very very much you know i know after eight o'clock at night I, I was never able to reach emma phone was off and she was starting to get get ready for mm. to to get, get to bed and, and, and rest, mm -hmm. um, which was, which was very important. You know, she made sure that she, um, she's not a big fan of ice baths. Um, 
Mm. So she didn't do that, but she made sure she had a lot of massages um, as much as he needed to do that type of stuff. We go to oxygen, she goes to oxygen chambers um, on a regular basis, at least once a week um, for, for extra recovery. So you're resting in that oxygen chamber, but you're also replenishing um, mm the red blood cells, which is great. Um, um, and then naturally your nutrition plays a major role. So everything becomes important. Everything that you do on a daily basis becomes important. And if you don't have a, it's, it's important that you have a set routine as well. Otherwise you just don't get to it. Right. Um, that's, that's one of the things I learned very quickly. If you don't go to your massage on a Thursday or whenever, you will that it will pass and you will so set appointments are important um constant communication with with the team surrounding surrounding your athletes are very important um, making sure that if if there is a you know if there is a fatigue level why is it happening um can we do something about it and luckily with with elite athletes they do know their bodies quite well and they can they can talk about can talk to you about it so you know if emma says to me i've got fatigue then i listen because they right. something is happening you know right. um yeah we made sure that there's there was blood tests done ever so often to make sure that nothing was that everything was 100 percent right yep. you know that the, the iron levels were fine, whatever the case might be. Um, but it becomes, yeah, it becomes, um, it becomes your life basically, especially yeah. now. And, and it's the same now in the build up to Paris, it becomes very important. It becomes your life and you, you must have a set routine for that. Yeah. I love that. looks like you're suffering from a little load shedding out in South Africa right now. Is that, is that happening? Um, yeah, we, it's a little bit dark here. So sorry, guys. <laughs> so for those, I, I was introduced to load shedding in South Africa. For those that don't understand what that means, just give us a quick brief explanation. So unfortunately we don't have, South Africa don't have enough electricity, um, for our daily use. So, um, we get load shedding, which means that for a certain amount of day, they cut power. Wow. Um, and they let us know when they cut the power. Thank goodness for that. There's an app where you can go onto and they, they cut the power. Um, but that means for sometimes two hours, sometimes four hours at end, there is no power in your region. Um, and you have to work around it. You know, um, that means you can't always cook food. Um, so your preparation becomes very important. You don't have lights. You can't always... Internet has become as easy. They've sort of dealt with that, but um, we just don't have access to any any power. So you have to deal with that as well. Wow, that's crazy. Well, people want to... I had to fix, what, what? Sorry, I had to fix the pools because mm. in the winter, naturally, we, didn't, we couldn't heat our pools up. So it's okay if it's two hours a day, but sometimes load shedding goes up to six. Um, there's different zones. And they, it can go up to six hours a day, and that was wow. terrible. Wow. And people people want to try and understand why South Africans are so tough. I mean, yeah. the, the, just the conditions sometimes that you guys go through to, just to live a normal life. Uh, that's why. It looks like the lights just came back on. The load shedding ended. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit better. I'm trying to, oh. to work around it a little bit. I like it. I like it. Well, uh, that's it. That's the discussion on load shedding. Um <laughs> You, I did want to dig into to something else, which which was great. You know, you talked about the holistic approach, which is which is great. You know, a lot of times in in traditional programs, we just talked about when you turned up at the pool, um, how much you swam, and then you left, and then you came back and did that again. That was kind of a traditional program. Is like how much volume did you do in this particular workout, and how much volume did you do over the week? Right, that's how we judged 
uh, a good week or a good swimmer is based on the volume they did, you know, and people, there was always these rumors going around of, Oh, I did 80, 80 K this week. And I did a hundred K. And it was like, that was kind of the the thing that you, you, you hung your hat on is how much work did you actually do in the pool? I've, I've been around those talks for many years as an Australian swimmer, don't get me wrong. But, um, but, but I loved how you talked about the holistic approach where you're, you're looking at what you're doing in the pool specifically. And then you're looking at what you're doing out of the pool as a combination. So you're doing your strength you're doing your mobility, you're doing your, your sleep, your recovery, your food, your nutrition, your psychology, you, you know, you're taking care of all of it. And that's part of the holistic approach of uh, the volume of work. That, and I talk about this, the volume of work yeah. that you're doing to be the best athlete, to be the best swimmer that you could possibly be. How much work do you do per day? And like you said, sometimes you just have to stick to a routine by saying, I do this at this time, boom, 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 boom. And all of that adds up into how much time you're willing to put in to being the best athlete, right? Yes, for sure. Um, and I think people underestimate um, the time that is that 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 uh, athlete or swimmer spend um, or on should their spend. daily. Yeah, or should spend. Let's <laughs> let's exactly. So, um, but yes, it's it's. You know, you don't just get to the pool and get in. You know, there's a 20-minute pre-warm-up or a 30-minute pre-warm-up, mm -hmm. um, which um, we do. And then you get in and do your set. And mm. then, yeah, and then there's mobility exercises afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so it is definitely, it's definitely a holistic, um, sorry, a holistic combination of right. factors that we're doing uh, right. uh, that we follow. Yeah. Um, and you know, we don't have to spend, uh, 20 hours a week <laughs> to do, because I was listening to the NCA in NCAA conference, uh, um, chat yeah. this morning and they said mm -hmm. they spent, they allowed 20 hours of work a week and you'll know more that you were a college, college coach. Um, yeah. um, you know, but that 20 hours can look like doesn't have to be swimming and land training. It mm -hmm. can be making sure that we following the right nutrition, going right. for bloods, going for um, making sure that you're doing your mobility exercises. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the way that the, the hours are made up, um, you know, it, I think it depends on, on the swimmer and it's very individual. Um, I, f I think it can be very individual and I yeah. think for your top, top elite swimmers, it should get individual because it should be about what works for that person or that swimmer. Right. Um, and that's what your a good coach should figure out. It's what works for that swimmer. Right. Well, um, what's next for South Africa? I, I was down there. I, I did see a lot of talent walking around the pool deck. Do you think that it's realistic to say that, especially on the women's side i'm looking i'm looking at this on the women's side because the south african men have traditionally been fairly strong the women uh, obviously have had um you know individual women that have gone out and, and done really well but like sprint wise I'm, I'm thinking collectively are we are we far away from seeing a south african relay make the final at the olympics i think we're getting better um, but we're not we're not close to the Aussies or the Americans. Um, right. I mean, the Aussies are just way ahead. I'm not sure if um, anyone's close to the Aussies. Don't worry no. about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, I would love to spend some time with those on the in, in some of those programs. But um, so I I think we are getting faster, but we're way off pace. You know, um, we're swimming 54s in South Africa. Mm. Um, our, our best female females um and yes we might be able to to qualify for a relay for for paris but we we not we're not close to to making a final at this stage mm -hmm. so you know i think we we need to learn more we need to spend more time in 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 getting our freestylers fast i think there's definitely a gap um um, there's not a, this, yeah, I think we can definitely, we, we get to, uh, a lot of our sprinters get to 26 seconds and then they just don't go anywhere. I'm talking females now. 
they just don't go anywhere from there. And I think we have to explore sprinting more, 50 and 100 meter, both mm. of them, and, I, and, and see how we can, how we can make, it, make them better um, and, and, and use different methods. I think resistance training, for instance, has not been used enough in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now um, both men and women, I think, uh, I think that there's a big lack um, of that. I think we're very traditional still in South Africa. Um, so we can maybe get uh, a, male, a good male swimmer to 50, maybe high 49s, but we just don't seem to be able to go much faster than that at this stage. Um, so the question is, why is it not happening? Why are we... What, what is wrong? Is it our strength training? You know, are we, um, are we too traditional in our strength training? Are we, because we are a rugby mad country, are we looking at <laughs> rugby program types of things? Are we specific enough in swimming? Um, are we, do we know, do enough strength training, both in the water and out the water? I don't always think so, um, especially in the water, um, I th- we spoke quite a lot about that tonight, but um, I think we can do uh, our dives and our first 15 meters can be much better. Um, right. In general, I think we need to explore that. Um, I'm actually with, I'm working with a uh, biomechanist, actually a 100 and 200 sprint coach, track and field coach at the moment to get Emma's um, first 15 better for, for Tokyo. Um so I think we have to explore and not be just be caught up in the general program so much. And mm. there is a place for general program. So don't misunderstand me. There's definitely a place we do it at, at our club as well. And, um, but I, I do think there's a place for a sprint program as well. And I think in South Africa at this stage, we don't explore that enough. And even our the few sprint programs that we have in South Africa is still very traditional. Um, we we scare to, um, I think a lot of coaches are scared to just do three kilometers a session, um, mm. or they they worry that they're not doing enough, that the mileage is not enough. Um, they always want to put add aerobic training at the end. Mm. Um, uh, so so I think this. A lot to explore, a lot to do, um, but yeah, um, hopefully we can lead the way with people like you coming to South Africa. Um, I'm hoping that the little bit that I'm doing um, is showing showing them that there is different methods as well. Um, people like Cam McAvoy is opening doors everywhere in the world. You know, and I think people are getting faster and faster. Um, the, the Aussie girls are amazing um i think also from a mental they're mentally very tough and what the coaches get uh, do with them and how they do different scenarios with them on pool deck i think that's 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 important and we have to to really look at um at everything out there and and find a way for our our goals to get to get good our goals are actually better than our boys at the moment yeah yeah <laughs> no, for sure like i i saw some talent walking around that pool deck i was like there, there's some girls here that you know like in in terms of physically i'm like you got the talent physically now it's just putting the, the other pieces together like you said um you know one of the things that i always did and, and leaned on was was the the sprint charts themselves right like to me they always had the answer in them you know, like it, it tells you in the speed charts of like, okay, if I want to be 53 seconds in the hundred and right now I'm 54, like this is the, this is the 15 meter I need to hit. This is the 25. This is the 35. This is the 50. This is the front end. This is the back end. This is the turn speed. This is the finish speed. Like those charts to me had all the answers in them. So it wasn't like I had to kind of recreate the wheel and figure it out myself. It was like somebody had handed me a blueprint. All I had to then do was go in and say, well, I've got to hit those speeds. Uh, do you do that yourself? Do you do, do dig into those charts? And do you feel like that's been done enough in South Africa? No, I don't think it. I, I think it's very difficult because our squats are so big. 
Um, right, right. You know, I had this afternoon in my sprint group, sorry, um, I had um, over 30 kids. Right. Um, so it's just, there's just no way um, to do to, it effectively. Do it effectively, exactly. Mm. So when I'm working one on one with MIS, then you know naturally you can do it. But um, in 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 the big groups, and, and and you saw what was going on at at places like Rocco, you just yeah. um, you know it's just not working effectively. And um, mm. so I think we need more of that for sure. Mm. Um, but I, yeah, so definitely, I think we need a lot of <laughs> a lot of different things. And I wish we could have, you know, some of the coaches that can have um, more assistance and more people on pool deck to help them with those type of things. Mm. So it's, it comes to education and um, making sure that, that your swimmers can hit those speeds when it's necessary. But, you know, I expect my swimmers, like today, I, I, I had to expect them to hit certain speeds and I couldn't even check it. Always, you know, right. I just had to make sure that um, uh, that they were doing what I'm asking them to do as effectively as possible. But they had a big responsibility in making sure they were hitting the right the right type of the type type of speeds. Right. Um, yeah. um, and I think that's us. Yeah, just to make ends meet at the moment. It's just we just have too many kids in the pool to to do it effectively, but. Saying that, I, I think you've got a, a point. We do need to it. And I think that's one of the things um, I lack in, and I think I asked you when you were here, how, if a, if a swimmer don't get to top speed, if you want them to hit top speed um, today and they don't get there, what, what would you do? What's, what, what's, what's the, do you add equipment? Um, yeah. Do you... How do you address it usually? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I think that um, you know you look at it and and you, and you try and come up with a solution of like why aren't they hitting top speed today? Okay, so it could be um, some factors that are going on inside the pool, right? It might be some some type of impingement or, or tightness that is not allowing them to get there physically. Um, you know, you can eliminate that. Then you could say, well, is it a mental thing? Are they are they prepared to go fast today mentally? Uh, did they did they did I give them enough warning to say this is what I expected from them, um, or or is it something that you know has shocked them and then just not ready for it mentally? So that you could you could tick that off. Then so they're they're kind of the or then the other thing is just um, you know what what have you done previously in the water? So mm-hmm. like, did I expect them? to be at top speed less than 12 hours ago. And then I'm asking them to be at top speed again. Maybe that's a factor. So they're, they're kind of the in the pool factors that I look at. And then if I try and eliminate those and say, well, it's none of those, then it can be some out of the water pool stuff. It's like, okay, d- did something happen that I don't know about? You know, like, is there, is there something outside of the pool that's in your head today and it's just affecting you? Um, is there, uh, you know, did you not get enough sleep last night? Did you not, did you not eat effectively, you know, nutritionally? So it's like you try and just eliminate those things quickly and assess them as quickly as you can. And then once you, once you find that the root of the problem, you say, okay, I, I can either address that by doing this. And like you said, adding equipment, which is generally what I would do is, is I'd add equipment or I'd, you know, maybe adjust the time, you know, give them a little bit more rest or, or what have you, you know, you can make adjustments within the workout. You might say, well, I'm expecting five rounds of this, but I'm only going to get three quality rounds. So let's, let's do three. So it's like, you can make those on the fly adjustments, or you can just say, Hey, that they're not physically or mentally ready for this today. We're going to have to put it aside. We'll do something else. We'll still, we'll still work effectively, but we'll do something completely different. We'll come back to this tomorrow for whatever reason. So that's kind of the quick assessments that I would do. Now, it is easier when you're dealing with a small group, you know, when you're dealing with 30 people and you're trying to make those assessments on 30 people, it's just, it's too difficult. So what I would do in that instance is I would say generally, if the group is showing me as a group, they're not ready for this, then it must be a physical thing. It must be like, okay, I've hit them hard enough. They're just not ready for this as a group, right? Like, but if you're just seeing it individually, generally it'll come down to one of those other circumstances um 
so that that's kind of the way I would assess it. Um, the other thing I'd say to you is like I would I would certainly put out a warning of of caution in that. Look, if you have the talent now and you know the talent is on the pool deck, and you know that you have these challenges that you talk about, you know, 30, 40, 50 people in the pool at the same time. And you know that that's not the most effective way to get the best out of the talent that you have. Then I would say to you, find a way to get it done. Now, don't wait two or three years for this talent to pass on and say, well, we missed on them. When we had the talent, we could have made these adjustments. And and then th two or three years down the road, you're like, well, we missed on them, but let's not miss on these people. Let's do something differently now. So like if you, to me, you've already um, put forth the, the, the challenges that you have. You, they're out there in the open. You know what they are, but you're also recognizing that you have some talent right now. So what I would say is just like find a way now. And if that means 25 of those kids come in for the first hour and the five of those kids come in for the second hour, it's still two hours of work. But those 25 kids are getting basically just what they need. And these five kids are getting some specificity. And you're saying, I'm going to work with these five kids right now because they're the top talent. And they're the ones that are going to get on the podium at the, at the you know, university games or Olympics or world championships. These, these are my five best talented kids. I'm not going to waste their years by squeezing them into this situation that is, is not the best for them, you know? So Again, I'm not lecturing you at all, and I'm not telling no, you what no. to do. I'm just saying, like, I see the talent now. I would really feel bad if that talent in three years from now didn't eventuate because we couldn't figure this out. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, and, uh, yeah, I, I think you're very right. And um, they, they, there's always solutions to problems. Right. It's just thinking out, outside the box a little bit. Right. Um, right. I agree with you. It takes a little so. bit more time and pro probably a little bit more commitment and maybe even on the on the behalf of – some of those other kids who aren't at that level, you might say, Hey, look, if you want to be in that elite group, you got to work, you got to work there. And then maybe that, maybe that gives them more incentive to earn, to be part of that top five. I don't know what it is, but, but I would say that, look, if you have the talent, you know, the time it takes and you know, the paces they need to hit, don't throw them in with everybody else. You know, like give them the, the, the time and attention that they need to potentially look, you've already had one person get to the semifinal Olympics, which is massive. Now it's time to build on that and grow from that. And that that's ultimately what you want. You want high performance. So don't get caught in those things holding you back from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, you're right. Uh, definitely. I, I think you've got a good point. And um, we we all need to think out of the box sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 and go the extra mile um, for sure. Yeah. Um, and, well, and, the, and the fact of the matter is you, you've done that already. I mean, you're doing it. You're flying the flag for sprinting in South Africa. Um, you're doing a fantastic job. You, you know, you're a female coach out there on your own, like you said. Not many of you out there that are doing this and, and kind of like taking a stance on this. And, it, it, you know, in South Africa and many parts of the world, it's kind of like this. It is a man's world in terms of the pool deck sometimes. You know, you, can't, you do feel isolated out there. And so to be as brave as you are to say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on sprinting and I'm a female doing this as well. Like that, that's a, that's a big leap of faith, you know? No, I agree. And, and um, you feel it sometimes, you know, you just mm. don't always get the respect. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. It doesn't matter if you have produced an Olympian or not, you still don't right. get the respect. Right. <laughs> right. Um, because they will always think it was just a one hit wonder, yep. you know? Yep. So you always have to, to pre you will always have to make sure that you do it again and, um, make sure that there's another one on the horizon, uh, horizon and make sure that you keep on going. Um, and that's, that's fine. Uh, luckily I love it. I, I, I really love it. So uh, I don't mind doing it and I will keep doing it. And, um, I, I hope I get to do it more male and female. I hope yeah. to, to produce many more in the future. Good stuff, Karen. I'm sure a lot of people will be inspired by this and learn a lot from this podcast in terms of just some of the chances you took and the things you're doing and willingness to share ideas and I appreciate it. So this has been very cool. Um, you know, thanks for doing this. I know we, we tried once and the load shedding got in the way of what we wanted to do. So we finally get this out, but um, now good luck over the next, you know, whatever it is, eight months into kind of trials and then the Olympics and hopefully you can get some similar results again. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care.
Bye, Brett.